Okay, students. Yep. All right. So this is the first lecture. It's taken a while to get this off the ground, um, but now we have the Moodle uh, working, and uh, I can upload this first video. Um, the so uh, a brief little introduction, I guess, even before we start that. If I go to uh, the syllabus, maybe we can go over the syllabus before I start the lecture um, on the material for today. So let's open that up. Um, uh, here, let me open it up in here. Maybe it'll file open these materials, syllabus. Let's see if it just pops up. Oh, yeah, it does. That's nice. Okay. So, um, this is going to be an entirely a distance class, uh, and we are, um, I'm going to be, just like last uh, semester in the electrodynamics course, I'm going to be recording a video probably once per week, uh, because this is going to be entirely new material, uh, where I use a variety of books. Uh, one of the books I'm going to be using is... Is uh, let me let me make another desktop with this. Come on, there we go. Is this Marquez book? There we go, Marquez book. I have found that really none of these books, whether it's um, uh, this Marquez with uh, right there. Or there's just a whole bunch of them. Here, let me get a few others. Um, I'll put these up online, uh, but they're all sort of bad. That's a word for it. Here's photonic crystal. That's not so bad. Um, but then there's a variety of metamaterial books. Um, here's one. Uh, Banerjee. Uh, Banerjee right there. Uh, likewise, uh, this one here, tutorials on, uh, where is it, by, by that one there. I'll make a list online of these. Um, and then also this big one here, uh, Theory of Metal Materials by Capolino. The um, reason I show you this is that they're all kind of bad. Uh, because the state of the affairs in med material books is that um, uh, these various folks are getting together with their colleagues and saying, okay, can you write a chapter? Can you write this chapter? Uh, or they cobble together some of, the, some of their own papers. And none of them uh, goes through a comprehensive treatment of uh, med materials. Uh, starting with the theory from Vizlago's paper, um, along with starting from Maxwell's equations, and step by step goes through and looks at um, uh, metamaterials from a fundamental point of view, and then going um, uh, applying that to particular type of meta atoms, uh, and then combining the meta atoms into periodic arrays, and then looking at the more sophisticated structures and applications. Uh, the best one is the uh, best book that at least has a couple of chapters that are good. Um, eh, and most of the book is really good. Is this Marquez, Marquez book, if that's how you pronounce it. The one I assigned in the syllabus. And so that's what I want to do is so I'm going to be every week um, cobbling together um, a much better, uh, in my opinion, uh, course material on this than any one of those books can provide. And so... So that's uh, and so I'm going to limit the lectures to once a week. Once a week, but we'll get through a lot of that, and then we will be um, um, having help sessions, but also lab sessions as well. I want to get you set up with numerical to do some simulations of these devices. All right. Um, so the course description: This course will teach the theory and application uh, on. Uh, of metamaterials. The different types of metamaterials that are covered include metamaterials that operate in the ultraviolet, the visible, the infrared, and the microwave spectral ranges. Um, acoustical metamaterials, we'll touch on that as well. 
negative index of refraction materials. Um, we'll work on that. Uh, hyperbolic metamaterials, near zero metamaterials, really very interesting. Uh, cloaking materials and light trapping structures will be studied. Um, prereqs, I just want you to know uh, electromagnetism really well. So you should have certainly had an extremely strong undergraduate uh, course in electromagnetics, or certainly uh, my 583, uh, my. Um, sequence in electromagnetics, graduate level electromagnetics uh, with Bolanus, or if you're in physics, if you have taken uh, a course based on Jackson's book, on uh, Jackson's book, which is the ZMKS version of Jackson, um, then that is perfectly fine as well, and so forth. Um, all right. So, a strong in electromagnetics. Um, so the textbook I assigned is the one from Ricardo Marquez, yeah. And uh, but like I said, we will be supplementing that with a lot of additional material. All right. All right. Um, the rest of this is Clark's uh, Clarkson's template. Uh, here's course outcomes: the ability to demonstrate knowledge of metamaterials, the ability uh, to demonstrate uh, knowledge of hyperbolic metamaterials. Um, other types of electromagnetic metamaterials. Um, so we're going to be going over all sorts of different types of meta atoms. Um, we'll also cover a bit uh, about how plasmonic structures, photonic crystals, and other things fit into this. Um, also acoustical metamaterials. And um, and then applications of metamaterials. We'll talk about that. Great breakdown. Um, this is a graduate program with a small number of you, so it's going to, uh, but basically if they're at homework, midterm, and final. But uh, the final, I say and or final project, because this course um, sort of lends itself more to a final project because of the nature of the material. So we're going to have that. Uh, more than likely instead. Um, okay, office hours. I am going to be holding Google Chat sessions 2.30 to 4 p.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and, uh, and, and my email address is right here. And uh, student participation statement. This is uh, Clarkson template. And, uh, and here's the schedule. So I'm going to be talking about the theory of metamaterials for this lecture, and then this will spill over into Thursday's lecture as well. Um, and then also, as I finish up the theory of metamaterials, I'll be getting more into the perfect lenses and hyperlenses, uh, because that, that, implement, that integrates in various aspects of the theory of metamaterials within, within this structure, within this as well. Then we'll talk about some synthesis of metamaterials, uh, microwave applications, hyperbolic metamaterials, cloaking metamaterials, um, extraordinary optical transmission, uh, chiral metamaterials, and applications. Okay. So uh, my goal is uh, later this week to get you set up with Lumerical again. Um, I guess all of you are familiar with Lumerical. So I prefer to use HSS, but um, I'll look to transition this over to um, all my codes and my curriculum over to Lumerical. So that may take just a touch for me to do that. But it'll be well worth it. And that's that. That's the syllabus. So. All right. So uh, I'll do my first Gmail uh, thing tomorrow. Um, at 2.30. All right. So uh, what, what I will do with this is uh, if you send me, uh, I will invite you to this Google chat through the Google system and, uh, and you'll either pick up or you won't. Uh, if you don't need help this particular week or anything, then uh, you may not pick up. If you do, certainly pick up and you can ask me any questions you want um, at the time. 
But yet, if uh, you have questions, uh, just like I've done with all the other courses that we've done together, you will. Um, you can email me at any time and call me up or you chat with me anytime you want. So. All right, so let's get on to lecture one. So I know that by now you will have learned most of this material that we'll go over today, um, but I will uh, want to go over it again um, from the beginning and uh, but as I get close to touching upon uh, metamaterial aspects or concepts that will be important for metamaterials, I'll slow down just a bit or at least highlight it so that you can see um, so that we can take a moment and look at uh, when Maxwell's equations and other fundamental laws of materials or electromagnetics start to um, impact um, or or a um, what's the word for it, or to uh, encroach upon uh, the theory of metal materials. All right, so uh, we'll start from the basics, but uh, but then I'm going to steer uh, every once in a while. I'll say, okay, this is where metal materials uh, starts to come into the picture, um, and I'll do that for for the introduction to electromagnetism, electrodynamics that we'll go over today. But then we're going to have to also get into, well, we're going to do some review of materials as well. And, uh, and that is when it comes, when we need to look at uh, how a material uh, generates an, a, an effect of epsilon. A permittivity, uh, the electric permittivity and the magnetic permeability. We have to study that a little bit more. And that's sort of the fault of uh, this. Of many of those books do not look into that to the degree I think is necessary for uh, folks to really uh, understand um, electric permittivity, magnetic permeability, and how to get those things to be negative um, or near zero or, or basically a prescribed value. Okay. So, but we have to first start with, with uh, electromagnetism. Let's see how we're doing here. It seems like it's working out nicely. All right. So, um, electromagnetism and uh, of any sort, whether it's regular materials or metamaterials, starts with Maxwell's equations. So this is Maxwell's equation in an MKS form. You got um, del dot d is equal to rho. That is the free charge put into the system. Not any polarization charge, which is also there, but uh, this row is only free charge, um, free external charge put into the material. Um, then we have del cross E is equal to minus dB dt. Uh, del dot B is equal to zero, no magnetic monopoles. Uh, del cross H is equal to J plus dD over dt. All right. We have the constitutive equations that relate uh, the flux densities D and B, the electric flux density and the magnetic flux density, and that's uh, equal to epsilon uh, E and uh, mu H. So the electric permittivity times the electric field and the magnetic permeability times the magnetic field. All right. So, and here are all the definitions. Uh, e is the electric field, D is the electric flux density, H is the magnetic field, B is the magnetic flux density, and you have the epsilon is mu, the electric permittivity and the magnetic permeability. All right, oh, so uh, I realize I've done this the wave equation twice in these notes, that's okay. So we're going to be looking at homogeneous materials, uh, basically where epsilon and mu are constants, and uh, as a function of position, meaning that they do not vary as a function of position. So we're going to take um, we're going to take this equation right here uh, and take the curl of it, and then use this equation. Uh, so so we have this equation uh, taking the curl of both sides, uh, and then we we have this. Uh, we can then we know what this is. We plug that in. In the meantime, over here on the left-hand side, we have uh, used our triple product rule to get it expressed like this, and we express it uh, further like this using del dot d is equal to the free charge. 
we get the left hand side being equal to this and the right hand side being equal to this. We take all the terms that involve electric field over to the left hand side so we get this on the left hand side um, and then we get the source terms on the right hand side here. All right. So um, similarly if we were to do the same thing for H uh, we, get, uh, we get this right here for H. Okay, so that's the wave equation, but um, what we're going to see here is we're going to look at this under a number of different situations. One where we don't have any sources, so my rho and j's are zero. Under time harmonic situations, so my uh, these all have a dependency uh, on time of, uh, according to e to the i omega t. And, uh, and then we'll be able to build up uh, the concept of plane waves. And then from that, we can see what happens when epsilon and mu are both positive or both negative, or one being positive and the other being negative. It sounds like a trivial thing, but that was uh, a huge step that Vizlago took when he said, okay, you know, I, I understand why plane waves can't propagate when one of those are negative, epsilon or mu. But it seems like everything is fine, and we can have wave propagation when both are negative. And, uh, and so then that leads to a whole host of interesting phenomena that we've been exploiting for the past 15 years, 20 years. So, so step by step uh, is what we'll do. So the first thing we're going to introduce is time harmonic waves into this. And so that's when all of the, all of the quantities rho, j, e, h, b, d, all have time dependence of e to the i omega t, e to the i omega t, all right? So introduce phasor notation, so my coefficients can themselves also be complex, but at the end of the day, the real parts um, are what we're looking for, so we have to take the real part of this phasor notation, all right? So all of these quantities have time dependence of this form, <clears throat> and we then substitute that into the wave equation, uh, taking second derivatives uh, with time uh, and uh, to get this right here. All right. So those are our two now wave equations. So now if we are looking in the source-free region, um, then the right-hand sides are both zeros. And then we get this for the source free. Okay, so you've seen this before. Uh, we get the del squared e uh, plus epsilon mu omega squared e is equal to zero, and the same for h. All right, and um, so that's what we have. And so now we're going to uh, try a, uh, a solution. All right, a solution of the form of e to the e capital E, times the exponential minus I K R. So we have the mi minus in here because we're doing our time dependence as plus I omega T. So when my K is positive, that with the negative in here, right here, that will represent a uh, plane wave that's propagating in the plus x direction if we only have kx as being non-zero. Alright, so these are some trial solutions that we're going to try and when we put that into the wave equation, those trial solutions, this is what we get. We have two i's that come down, so that turns into a negative. And this is what we have. Um, fine. And so a lot of things cancel. This leads us to that k is equal to epsilon mu times omega. Right. Um, now we can write this as we've done in other courses. That epsilon is the electric permittivity, but that can be written as a product of the permittivity of free space times the relative permittivity. And mu is equal to uh, the permeability of free space times relative permeability. So then uh, we then find that 
uh, c, the speed of light, is equal to 1 over square root of epsilon naught mu naught. Um, so, uh, we also define n as equal to the square root of epsilon relative mu relative. Okay? But note in here, in the wave equation, we will then have n squared. So we really could have uh, n being plus or minus this, and the wave equation would not be changed at all. What's the wave equation? Right here. So if we take plus or minus square root epsilon times mu squared, you still get this. So we could let n potentially be minus the negative root. And this is what Vizlago had advocated. And I have Vizlago's original paper, 1967 or 1968 paper, online. So in fact, I'm going to assign that as a homework problem to read uh, and get as far as we can on this, on Vizlago's paper at the moment, along with David Smith's paper, this is what, 1998 paper? And, uh, and we'll be able, you'll be able to digest or understand more of it as the semester goes, goes on. But Vizlago advocated saying, well, we can actually include both roots, both the positive root, the plus here, and the minus root, so either plus or minus here for n. All right? k itself uh, is equal to n over c times omega, where this n now can be plus or minus. So k itself can be plus or minus, okay? Um, so, so now let us go back and look at the trial solution more closely. So this is what we have for the trial solution. <clears throat> With the time dependence inserted, we have that electric field is equal to this right here. So we have the full time dependence in there. Um, and now let's consider when we have um, the way propagating only in one direction, in the x direction, so we have this. Uh, so, and then, then we say, okay, well now let's consider the condition that has E only as a constant, so let's follow, say, the crest of the wave, where E is a maximum. Well, to stay on that maximum, we have to have this be a constant value. So let's let that constant value, for the moment, be zero, all right? So this then tells us how x and t have to vary such that we always stay at that peak. And that's the, that will tell us the speed of that wave, the speed of the peak of that wave. Or it could be the trough that we're on, or somewhere in the middle. But it's, we're staying at some location on that wave, some fixed location on that wave, um, and so forth. Um, all right, sort of like a surfer, sort of halfway up the wave, always staying at that point. Uh, as time progresses, you'll see you'll see that that person goes closer to the shore. So there's a relationship between where they're at relative to the shore and the time. That's called the phase velocity, and it's always omega over k is the phase velocity. All right. Thus, we have planes of constant phase and magnitude that travel through space at a velocity of v phase is equal to omega over k. Um, so using k is equal to nc over omega, uh, we have the phase velocity is also c over n. So if we're in a material uh, where the index of refraction is greater than 1, uh, the phase velocity is reduced. All right? In free space, n is equal to 1, and v phase is equal to c. So, um, that's phase velocity. Later on, when we get into uh, looking at um, packets of waves, uh, we will introduce a concept called group velocity that, that tells how the um, center of this wave packet moves. And that's called the group velocity. Um, okay. So also in the source-free space with constant epsilon and mu, for these trial solutions, for these solutions of like this, um, we will put those into Maxwell's equations, and we find that this Maxwell equation gives us k dot e is equal to 0. Therefore, these vectors 
E and K are orthogonal with respect to each other. So E, as you know, contains both the direction and magnitude of the electric fields in the planes. K points in the direction of travel of these planes. All right. So in general, E uh, is equal to this, and written in its full vectorial form, and it has an x component, y component, and z component. It has an amplitude given by this. It has a polarization given by this. It has, uh, a wave vector is this vector k, and the angular frequency omega. So when looking at this uh, wave in two ways, one as time varies and two as space varies, um, we find so as time varies, we say, okay, let, let's look at a delta t in time beyond t. Put that in, and we find that uh, that we can express that this way. This is e just a t, and this is the additional phase component that's picked up by this wave after delta t in time. Okay. So if this delta t is an integer multiple of 2 pi over omega, um, then the wave af after a certain after this delta t in time gets back to its original uh, shape. So therefore, uh, every 2 pi over omega segments in time, the wave returns to its same state. Thus, capital T, this 2 pi over omega, is the period of the wave. All right. You know that. Okay, but we're just redefining or reanalyzing every aspect of plane waves because it turns out for metamaterials some weird things happen with plane waves. All right. Really, any waves, uh, but any wave can be expressed as a summation of plane waves. And so, what happen? What weird things happen with plane waves will manifest in any waves going through the metamaterial. So when looking at uh, a snapshot in time but different spatial locations, let's look at what happens at, at a delta r away from the original starting point uh, r. So we put that into the solution, uh, trial solution we're trying. And uh, we can be expressed in this way, it can be ex and taking this down, simplifying it here. We see that if k dot delta r is equal to 2 pi m, then the wave returns back to its same state, namely translating in space in the same direction of as k by an amount of 2 pi over k returns the wave to the same state. Thus, this delta r is called the wavelength, namely 2 pi over delta oh, over magnitude of k. That is the wavelength. All right. So another property of waves is the energy it contains and transports. Uh, so we will be getting into this a lot in a lot greater detail. No, no, we'll derive this again because uh, we're going to have to look a little bit further than what um, I think even Bolanus does into dispersive materials, lossy materials, and rederive a couple of forms of this pointing vectors, uh, pointing pointings. Theorem. All right, but um, at its simplest, the pointing vector is the energy per unit area, um, and it's a wave. So this this energy is progressing at a certain velocity through space, and it's that s, the pointing vector, is equal to one half e cross h. All right, there's no epsilons and there's no mu's in here. So, um, meaning that it doesn't matter if we're in a metamaterial or a regular material. Namely, a regular material with both epsilon and mu being positive, or a metamaterial where both epsilon and mu are negative, S will always be 1 half E cross H. So, with these plane waves, let's go back to Maxwell's equations for time harmonic and source free conditions and homogeneous materials. So we have e dot d is equal to zero. This leads to k dot e is equal to zero. We have e cross del cross e is equal to minus i omega mu h. This takes us to k 
cross E is equal to omega mu H. Del cross H is equal to zero. This takes us, leads us to K dot H is equal to zero. And del cross H is equal to I omega epsilon E. And this leads us to K cross H is equal to minus omega epsilon E. All right. Um, so that's what we have. Uh, we can work with this, this a little bit more and uh, do E cross K cross E. All right, so we have triple product here. Um, that, using our vector calculus rules, is K magnitude E squared minus E, E dot K. Uh, this is zero, so it reduces down to this. Um, and now E cross K, K cross E is equal to omega mu E cross H. So we have E cross H then is equal to vector k from here uh, divided by omega mu e squared e squared right there all right so positive positive and mu can be positive or negative all right um, so e h and k form a triad of vectors a trio of vectors now, so we're going to consider four cases um, with different signs of epsilon and mu. All right, so case one. As the case with epsilon greater than zero and mu is greater than zero. We find that we have self-consistency in our equation. So let me explain what I mean. So we have the k cross e. So if we do our right hand rule and draw k and e, find we have k, let me see. We have, yeah, let me zoom out here. We have k, k cross e and h is pointing out of the board. Or um, and so k if you do your k cross e k cross e and this is positive then uh, you use your right hand rule and you see that h is is come, going that way all right and so then you check this that direction with uh, this equation you do k cross h k cross h and and your thumb is pointing downwards but remember. Um, E is positive, and you, then you have this negative. So this negative, so your thumb should be pointing in the negative direction because uh, this here is uh, proportional to the negative E. So um, E itself is pointing upwards. So these two are self-consistent with, um, are consistent with respect to each other for epsilon greater than zero and mu greater than zero. And likewise, if you do uh, E cross H, E cross H, K should be pointing in that direction when your mu is positive. So all of those are consistent with respect to each other. So, so, we use a, so therefore we use a right hand rule uh, in any one of these equations and they all provide the same answer. And so it all works out quite nicely. All right. And we can have plane waves of the form of the um, have plane waves uh, of this form where k is real, omega is real, and everything works nicely. Okay, but now let's, when case two, where one of them is negative, namely epsilon is negative, but mu is positive, we do not have this consistency. So the first equation, k cross e, uh, do the same thing, and it says, well, h should be pointing out in this direction. But when you look at k cross h, you say, okay, k cross h would seem to want to have uh, k cross h, that e is pointing downwards, okay? 
um, because with this being negative, that cancels this negative. And so k cross h will be pointing in the direction of e. But that's not equal, equivalent to this, because this said e should be pointing the other direction. All right, so those two equations do not, are not consistent. And so uh, what this means is that materials with this being negative, epsilon being negative, and mu being positive, cannot support plane waves that propagate through the material. All right? These are metals, so you know that, um, that waves won't go through metals. Um, and uh, so, so that's the case. All right. Less commonly known as case three, uh, where it's not epsilon that's negative, but mu is negative. So mu is negative, epsilon is positive, and again we have this inconsistency. Using this equation, uh, your, your k cross e, h points in this direction. But using k cross h, um, we find that uh, k, e, and h have this orientation with h coming out of the paper. So again, an inconsistency. So a material with mu being negative but epsilon positives cannot support propagating plane waves. All right. But then um, Vizlagos found that you know if both are negative, then we have a, a mutually consistent, a consistent situation where the k cross e and the k cross h equations uh, are both predict this orientation: k, e, and h. Um, K is this direction, E is up, and H is uh, back the board. And so what that says is that if you do the... Uh, all right, and so thus these equations seem to support propagating waves. They, they in fact do, okay? But there's a lot more to this story. All we've done so far is show that there's as of yet no inconsistency in the equations. But we'll uncover a lot of interesting phenomena. Uh, some of those phenomena or properties will limit or greatly impact uh, the, these waves, the ability of these waves to exist and to propagate through the material um, in any significant way. All right, but um, certainly not impossible. So, but as it turns out, these materials will be dispersed. We'll talk about that. Um, and even and a bit lossy as well, um, and we'll we'll show how Maxwell's equations and material science um, requires uh, dispersion and some loss in these metamaterials, but not just yet. Okay, so like I said before, later uh, we will show explicitly that S is still given by one half e cross h. We'll get into that a little bit later, but trust us for the moment that it does. So um, this is true even when epsilon and mu are both negative. Hence, we see that S and K point in opposite directions. So here we do e cross h, e, cro e cross h, and it points uh, in the other, uh, other direction if we're using our right hand. If we're using our left hand, e cross h, points in the correct direction. So that's why these are called left-handed materials, because we have to switch our hands. Instead of using E cross H to get K, we have to use the left hand. E cross H gives us the right direction for K. All right. However, um, uh, for the pointing vector, we still have to use the regular right-hand rule, E cross H. So um, if we go back up here now, Using the true left-hand rule for um, E cross H, we get E cross H is equal to S, and S would be pointing in the opposite direction of K for this material with both of these parameters being negative. All right? Hence, we see that S and K point in the opposite directions. So let's remember what... Uh, what K is. K is the direction of, the, of phase propagation, the direction of those crests of the waves or the troughs of the waves. It's the direction of the waves themselves. Whereas S is the direction of the energy flow. 
So in, manament, in regular materials, K will be in somewhat the same direction as S. All right. Certainly in, in homogeneous isotropic materials, they will be absolutely in the same direction. In metamaterials, or materials with epsilon and mu both being negative, they will be in opposite directions. So what you'll see is if you look at the way the crests of the waves are moving, in a metamaterial, oddly enough, uh, that will be in the opposite direction of the flow of energy. And it's so counterintuitive when you first are told that. That you take a look at um, a wave as, as a function of time and see that the waves are moving in one direction. If it's a metamaterial, meta the energy flow is going to be in the opposite direction. And that kind of boggles the mind about how that can be because almost invariably, al always, you will have associated the energy flow with the movement of those waves. And that's just not the case with metamaterials. So hence, waves in these materials seem to be flowing backwards, meaning uh, in the opposite direction of the energy flow. Um, and so therefore this is sometimes why it's sometimes called backward, backward, wave backward propagation. So. so I've already gone over the wave equation um, and how we've taken the triple product and gotten this um, and, and we will see that this equation uh, allows for propagating waves from materials with either mu and epsilon both positive or mu and epsilon both negative. If only one is positive and the other negative, then the wave, then wave propagation is not possible. Okay, so now what we have to do, uh, the next thing we're going to be doing is boundary conditions. Okay, and um, so, uh, but Instead, of, we're at, right at, I think, close to the 45-minute mark. We will cover that in Thursday's lecture because it turns out where boundary conditions are extraordinarily important, of course they are, but that leads to um, the second incredible uh, thing with metamaterials. The first is the opposite direction of K and S, all right? And we'll show that in numerical. Um, once we get the, uh, the infrastructure set up for that. So that's item number one, truly amazing, that S and K are about in opposite directions. Uh, second thing that we're going to show is the um, negative index of refraction. Uh, so when a light coming from a regular material, say air, hits a flat interface of a, of a metamaterial, how Snell's law is changed to do something that no material had ever been shown to, uh, to do before metamaterials came along, all right? And, um, and it caused quite a stir. Um, okay, so yeah, we're, we're close to 45 minutes, so we'll, we will do that for Thursday's lecture. All right, take care, everybody. I'll also assign a homework problem, uh, assignment.